unless you need this for the AV. You do? Okay. Um, Is it turned on? Uh, make do with it. Uh, you coming out uh, in all the rain, um, and hopefully this will be uh, worth your while. Um, if I could just have a quick show of hands, how many people are in finance uh, or in kind of the corporate world or in banking? Just so I have a sense of the audience um, and your interest. Okay, all right, fair enough. Fair enough. That's quite all right. I sort of anticipated that. Um, you know, we're we're uh, we're far removed. Um, uh, from Wall Street, uh, for better or worse. Um, okay, uh, what I'll try to do is uh, introduce Islamic law to you quickly, um, as it's relevant to the subject, uh, talk a little bit about um, Islamic finance and how that fits within the religion of Islam and within the framework of Islamic law, and then we'll look at the financial crisis uh, that we've seen since 07-ish. Uh, uh, causes, primary causes of the crisis, and how Islamic financial principles uh, might be relevant uh, to those causes, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spend kind of the bulk of the time on, on that, um, and then we can certainly uh, take your questions and uh, uh, afterwards, but if I'm saying something and I'm kind of you know, really going over your head or I'm not making any sense, uh, please feel free to stop me uh, to ask for a uh, clarification. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd start with a quote um, that goes back to 2008 uh, from The Guardian. Um, it's a woman named Anne Pettifor. Uh, she says, quote, let us make no bones about it. This financial crisis is a major spiritual crisis. It is the crisis of a society that worships at the temples of consumption that, and that has isolated and often abandoned millions of consumers now trapped on a treadmill of debt. It is the crisis of a society that values capital, capital gains of the rentier more highly than the rights of a people to a home or to an education or health. It is the crisis of a society that idolizes money above love, community, well-being, and the sustainability of our planet. And it is a crisis, in my view, for faith organizations that have effectively colluded in this idolatry by tolerating the sin of usury." End quote. It's uh, Anne Pettifor, Face to Faith, The Guardian, uh, October 11, 2008, um, is the, uh, the date of the quote there. So what we have is, uh, in, in many circles, uh, now we've got some, you know, the benefit of hindsight uh, to look at this quote and to think about uh, the crisis. And this is something that she was saying sort of early on at the outset of the crisis, and we've got the benefit um, of, uh, of, uh, of a few years of experience seeing how the crisis has gone, what's developed, uh, and how people are reacting and interpreting uh, the crisis. But in many circles, uh, certainly it seems among the people, if you will, there is a fundamental rethinking uh, of finance, uh, of economics, of business, and how it fits into our lives. <clears throat> Basic assumptions are being challenged and questioned, at least in some circles, including the role of banks and regulatory authorities and mechanisms, consumer, uh, customer treatment, if you will, and rules relating to how financial products are innovated and distributed. Uh, the pace of the economic decline has been fairly rapid uh, and fairly wide, globally speaking, um, and it has led to a landscape that is very different, certainly socially uh, and socioeconomically, uh, for, uh, for probably most people, at least uh, in the U.S., uh, than the landscape we saw preceding the crisis. I hesitate with some of my comments because I'm not really sure uh, that uh, these, the lessons that can be learned are being learned both by politicians, uh, by regulatory authorities, uh, and certainly uh, critical uh, Wall Street-based uh, institutions, and, and you know, we can extend that out to major global uh, financial institutions. So Islamic finance now is something that is pretty recent as a phenomenon. You're talking about something that's around 40 years old in its contemporary form in terms of its practice. Uh, if you want to talk about the theory for it, we can go back a couple more decades. But you're talking about something that is fairly young uh, and that is somewhat immature and in its infancy uh, itself. 
uh, Islamic financial institutions have generally been immune from the crisis. Um, I say generally because there has been an effect upon them, and we can get into that as to how and why that effect has come about. Uh, but generally, they've, uh, they've sort of weathered the storm a whole lot better uh, than their conventional counterparts. And when I use the word conventional, I'm sort of, uh, you know, using that word to juxtapose against the Islamic institutions, uh, in other words. Um, so you have, you know, comments now vis-a-vis -vis Islamic finance from various circles, uh, not the least of which is, interestingly, the Vatican, uh, which issued a statement that said, quote, ethical principles on which Islamic finance is based may bring banks closer to their clients and to the true spirit which should mark every financial service, end quote. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, and we'll get into uh, kind of the irrelevance of Islamic finance uh, uh, shortly. Um, <clears throat> there is, uh, I think it's worth sort of mentioning at, at the outset that most Muslim nations uh, and their economies uh, do not function on an Islamic basis. So we need to get, uh, we need to push aside the stereotype very quickly, uh, maybe it's not a stereotype, but a common assumption, which is that Islamic law is somewhere on this earth wholly enforced. Uh, it is not. Um, there are only parts and pieces of Islamic law, uh, generally in personal status matters, marriage, divorce, inheritance, and child custody, generally speaking, in Muslim countries use some combination of uh, Islamic law with uh, whatever other local law or foreign law. But generally speaking, the legal systems of Muslim countries are a combination uh, of um, local edicts, local pronouncements, whether they be of a monarch or a dictator, uh, if there's a difference between the two, um, and sort of uh, colonial master's law, so Dutch, French, British. Uh, so a lot of these countries are civil law systems, and a lot of them are common law systems. So that's one common assumption to probably get out of the way uh, early on. Uh, most of these countries, their economies are not organized around Islamic law or Islamic ethical principles. Uh, they use conventional principles. Uh, so they are much the same, uh, perhaps without the quantitative success, uh, as their Western Hemispheric counterparts. Um, most of Islamic law, uh, whether in theory or in practice, is not governmentally enforced. Uh, it is a matter of private conscience. Uh, so what's interesting about the Islamic finance industry is that it is something that developed um, without uh, governmental involvement and input at the outset. These are individuals, often high net worth investors, uh, who decided that there should be something like an Islamic bank uh, or an Islamic financial institution and went ahead and sort of theorized about it and created it. So it's something that has been created um, and furthered and supported uh, more and more uh, by uh, the, the people, if you will, uh, by a return to faith, uh, which is marking uh, the Muslim world generally uh, over the last, uh, let's say, 40 years or so, maybe longer, depending on the country and so forth. Um, but generally, the return to faith has included a support for Islamic finance or for the idea of Islamic finance. Uh, for many Muslims, uh, the idea of Islamic law, of Islam, represents uh, optimism, hope. Um, if you want to translate the word Islam, the, the word Sharia, uh, a word that probably a lot of you have seen, I'm going to step here quite a bit, um, spelled in various forms. Uh, the word Sharia is usually translated as Islamic law. Uh, we'll deal with that in, in a little bit. Uh, but the word, the idea of Sharia usually means uh, to Muslim people, justice, in one word, fairness. Um, and you're talking about financial and economic uh, activities or, or, or frameworks, and you're talking about transparency uh, and social and economic justice uh, as well. So as much as this term is one that's an unknown and a source of maybe fear in some circles, uh, it is also a source of hope and optimism uh, in, uh, for, for many, many uh, people uh, across the globe. Um, <clears throat> The religion of Islam understands human beings to be composed of kind of two components, if you will, two constituents, the material and the spiritual. Uh, the Sharia are those principles and norms that bring the material and spiritual into balance. Um, so that's a better way of understanding Sharia. Um, there is law in Sharia, but there's a lot more than law. 
There's matters of theology and belief. There's matters of uh, principles and ethics and morals. Uh, and even etiquette and manners uh, are all sort of, uh, you know, sort of thrown into the mix, if you will, when we're talking about the Sharia. Um, so I'm going to continue to use that, uh, that Arabic word. Um, <clears throat> So just as uh, the human being is understood to be you know, the material and the spiritual, uh, there, are, there is this similar mirroring of this dual nature in Sharia. Uh, and so Islamic law, when it speaks to uh, matters of finance, matters of business, money matters, um, <clears throat> you're talking about the realm of Islam that deals with uh, the worldly or the secular. Um, <clears throat> and so from Sharia, um, the, is derived, uh, what in Arabic is called, it's a Q, fiqh, literally understanding, uh, but this is the uh, interpretive result of human beings, men and women, uh, to understand the Sharia uh, and its applicability to different contexts, different situations, uh, different matters, whether they be visiting the sick, uh, charity, uh, or contracts, or criminal law or matters of worship such as prayer and pilgrimage and fasting and so on. Um, so it's in this, so this word, if you're going to use a word and translate it as law, it's probably this word here. That would probably be best translated as law or as jurisprudence. So it's in this realm here that you have commercial law, the law of finance uh, in Islam comes sort of as, this, as a result of this interpretive, uh, interpretive effort. <coughs> Now, kind of jumping gears, um, if I can, um, I'll list uh, three sort of causes, if you will, um, of the financial crisis. And there's actually a remarkable, at least based on my reading, there's a remarkable degree of consensus about what caused and brought about uh, the crisis, uh, which itself is pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> the first um, is uh, excessive lending and borrowing, oftentimes with misrepresentations from either side. Um, <clears throat> there's problems relating to securitization. I'll explain what that is since I'm assuming that generally people don't know. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the misratings that went along with it. Um, <clears throat> and then governance failings. Okay. Um, can I erase this, this little, this very complex diagram? <laughs> uh, and we'll try to take each of these uh, in turn uh, and, and talk about uh, the role that Islamic finance uh, or the relevance of Islamic finance, spiritual ethics, uh, might play um, in this realm. <clears throat> so we have, uh, there's, there's an organization, and uh, I, forgive me for having not written down its name, uh, but composed of leaders uh, from the Christian faith, um, and, the, and including the Archbishop of Canterbury, for instance, um, and the Grand Mufti of Egypt. And uh, they issued a statement that said, quote, clearly as religious leaders, we want to say that the root problem is human greed, which is not specific to any one nation or even to the governing class or any one religion, um, which I think is, uh, is a pretty interesting comment that I think we, that we want to keep in mind um, that we're going to be talking about theories and principles, um, and this doesn't sort of uh, exculpate uh, Muslims, if you will, uh, from uh, the impetus or the, the motive of greed, um, both uh, in theory uh, as well as in uh, actuality. So the first, um, the first uh, cause, excessive lending and, uh, and borrowing. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, um, <clears throat> Islamic spiritual teaching, teachings seek to curb desire for the material um, by placing that desire within certain prescribed limits um, and to place certain controls upon that. Uh, basically speaking, if I were to sort of summarize um, the, the, the sources of the Sharia, uh, <clears throat> we would find that it is not this world but the next world that receives a centrality uh, within Islamic teaching. 
that the world of the afterlife, the eternal afterlife, is uh, significantly more important uh, than this world, and, and that might be putting it uh, lightly. Um, <clears throat> the believer focuses his and her life um, on worship of the divine, broadly construed, so that worship includes uh, earning a living as well as spending uh, what you've earned uh, <clears throat> in ways that are pleasing to the divine as understood again um, from the Sharia. <clears throat> the use of debt is generally discouraged. Uh, in Islamic teachings, uh, more so for personal consumption purposes than for developing productive assets such as land uh, or equipment. Um, and there are other texts that frown upon dying in debt, uh, that frown upon slipping into negative equity, in other words, owing more than you own or you possess, spending more uh, than you have, uh, and not living within uh, your means. <coughs> And probably the most conspicuous aspect of Islamic finance is something called riba, uh, which is not unique to the religion of Islam. Certainly, uh, it has its parallels in other Abrahamic faiths, um, though it appears that um, the teaching retains a greater importance within uh, Islam uh, than it does elsewhere at this time. Um, the riba is commonly translated as interest, or as usury. Um, and that's probably a decent, loose definition. Um, the most helpful way and relevant way for us to think about it um, is anything above the principal amount of a loan. So if I loan you $100 and you say I'll give you back 110 in two years, that extra $10 is a riba. Um, <clears throat> If I said, um, I will loan you $100, pay me back 100 and if you don't mind giving me a ride to work every now and then, that would be kind of helpful too. Uh, that ride to work every now and then, that's also riba. So anything above the principle um, is something called riba, or interest, or you know, whatever you are, an unjust enrichment in a loan transaction. Um, and that is something that is prohibited uh, by Islamic law. Um, <clears throat> Now the current crisis, obviously, uh, we saw a lot of lending um, that probably shouldn't have been done. We saw a lot of borrowing that probably shouldn't have been done, um, and you know certainly we saw the, the subprime mortgage lending, um, and we saw a lot of uh, you know, the interest-only mortgages, the unsecured loans in the form of credit cards uh, that had a you know sort of contributed to the frenzy that then brought down. Uh, these, uh, the, the global economy. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about how you know, the excessive lending and the subprime lending and so forth then led us uh, to, to the second cause. But before I do that, I think it's worth mentioning that as much as Islam places an, a, an emphasis on the next life and on living within one's means um, and discouraging the use of debt, Islam does encourage that your wealth be circulated, that your wealth be utilized uh, productively, um, and that you not hoard it or just sort of keep it out of um, circulation in society, if you will. Islam certainly um, encourages profit, um, <clears throat> or at least permits it, probably encourages it, is, is, is probably a fair statement. But again, profit seeking that takes place within certain boundaries, that has limits, uh, where the, the limits of the divine in terms of how you treat other people, how you treat the earth, how you treat the rest of creation, whether you're talking about animals or plants, uh, and so on and so forth. All of those are the limits that are relevant um, and that can control the profit-seeking uh, motive um, that, uh, that perhaps all of us have uh, on some level. Now, one of the things that Riva uh, ends up encouraging, that the, this rule ends up encouraging, is this idea of risk sharing. If, you were, if I were to sum up conventional finance um, <clears throat> in one word or a phrase, I would say risk shifting. Um, and if I were to sort of contrast that with Islamic principles, we would talk about risk sharing. And I say that because the reason that riba is prohibited is that the lender, the person providing the money, the person providing the capital, 
um, does not bear what's called an asset risk or a market risk. The lender only bears a credit risk, right? If I loan to, your name is David? Yeah. If I loan to David and I say, David, pay me back, uh, you know, in 20 years, and David says, I'm gonna go, you know, open up a bookstore on the corner, um, and so on. Um, and I say, okay, fine, you have to pay me back, you know, every quarter, um, what you've borrowed, a little bit of what you borrowed, plus a little bit of interest. Um, I, don't, I don't bear a risk with, with regard to his business. If his bookstore does really well, I get paid the same. If his bookstore you know, tanks, I, get, I, I do the same no matter what. I bear a credit risk, the risk that I won't be repaid, or the risk of repayment. Um, so that risk is not, a lo not enough alone under Islamic law to entitle me to earn a profit on that loan. I've got to bear an asset risk or a market risk, meaning I've got to somehow, in some form, partner thank you, with David and his, uh, what were you doing, a business a bookstore, right? Um, so, <clears throat> that's probably a tough business these days. Um, <clears throat> but I've got, to, I've got to bear the risk of loss as well. So I share the downside as well as the upside. And that risk, is what entitles me to earn a profit. Absent that risk, I'm not entitled to earn a profit. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of just a sort of a, a basic um, rationale for why and how riba is uh, uh, is prohibited. And you know, you can sort of extend that out and begin to think about um, sharing risk. Uh, you can think about mutuality. Uh, you can think about inclusiveness. You can think about creating and building a broad base of stakeholders in an economy, uh, and you can think about that if you want, if you would like, in lo loosely speaking, in democratic terms. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the first cause, uh, if you will. Uh, I should probably speed up a little bit. Um, second cause, securitization. Um, anyone know what securitization is? No. No. Okay. Securitization is basically, in this context, it's the pooling um, of loans and selling interests in that pool. So let's say I've, sold, I've lent Tom, David, and your name? Kara. Kara, money. Okay, so we've got Tom, is it T, David, you C or K? C. C. Okay, so I've got three loans here. <coughs> I, I put them in a pool, this is a pool, like a, you know, I box them in. I've created a collective investment vehicle and I sell uh, the four of these individuals here interests in these loans. So now the three of them combined may owe me, let's, let's keep it simple, a million dollars over 10 years. I want money now. I want to go make more loans. So I'll say, listen, the four of you pay me 900 grand today, and you have the right to receive that million over 10 years. And that works for you because you don't need money now. You're willing to make the profit in 10 years. That's securitization. Right? You're basically taking um, a set of assets and you're pooling them together and then you're selling interests in the pool. So each of you has a fractional interest in this pool and in these loans. Um, first, Pete, the first sort of issue with this is the discounting of the loan. Um, if Kara owes me uh, you know, 350000 and I and I want to buy that, the right to receive that money for 300000 that's a rip-up. So that automatically gets prohibited. And that becomes a big problem if you're talking about the sale of debt. Because it doesn't really make a whole lot of economic sense to sell $350,000 or the right to receive three hundred fifty dollars later for three fifty dollars now. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the first issue. Um, <clears throat> now, with securitization transactions get rated. Uh, there are ratings agencies that are paid, oddly enough, by the seller. So in this case, me. Um, I hire a rating agency, Standard Poor's, uh, you know, Fitch, what have you, um, and they provide a rating. They do an assessment on this pool. What's the uh, risk classification? Um, and the four of them are going to rely on that risk classification in determining whether to buy. Because they don't know Tom, David, and Kara. They don't, let's say I lent you on your homes, right, just so that you could buy your homes. They haven't visited the properties. They don't know the area. They're not even from the U.S. They're from some other country somewhere else. So they're just relying on this rating, basically, to buy these loans. Um, now, what we saw in the economic crisis was a lot of misratings. 
uh, errors, both intentional um, as well as uh, unintentional, technology glitches, so on and so forth. And we, of course, have this whole conflict of interest problem, where I, the seller, am paying the rating agency uh, to tell them whether it's a good investment. Now, naturally, I want to sell, I want them to buy, so there is a motivation that I have, and certainly the rating agency, as the recipient of my money, um, has something to, uh, has a certain incentive as well that's built into that. Um, so that's your first kind of your first kind of issue. Now, securitization transactions get a lot more complex than that. What happens is um, you are Iqbal. Okay, so Iqbal then sells to let's say that six or seven people in the corner there. Those six or seven people sell to the th three or four of you back over there. So securitization, what happens is each of your interests now constitutes a pool. And it, each, it keeps getting broken up. Okay? So your homes are here. These are houses, believe it or not. Um, your homes are here, and this is Tom, David, and Kara here, like that. <clears throat> so you see how far away you're getting from the actual homes, the actual borrowers, from understanding the home, the property, the loan, their credit profile, who they are, whether they can repay, so on and so forth. And that's how uh, the effect, or that's part of how the effect uh, of subprime lending was global, right? Because it kept going, it kept being sold to banks in Europe, banks in Asia, banks in the Middle East that were not Islamic, ball. I know institutions that lost hundreds of millions, if not more, buying these assets, or these types of assets. And these are termed in some circles as toxic assets. These were the assets that caused the problem. Because when these folks defaulted, whether it was their fault or not, um, and oftentimes they weren't told you know, how their mortgage would work, uh, you know, it was a floating rate of interest that way went up way uh, as well. Um, <coughs> One thing I think that's kind of interesting um, as a brief case study that had a ripple effect throughout all of these pools, all of these buyers, and the various geographies that uh, would be represented uh, in them, uh, or at least among, uh, in, in the, in the uh, set of buyers, uh, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, Islamic finance, the first issue here is the sale of debt. Uh, being a problem according to the vast majority of interpretations of the Sharia as a sale of debt is something that is prohibited. Um, and the issue of misratings, uh, you know, the idea of honesty, transparency, uh, a seller telling the buyer what it is that you're buying uh, up front and uh, exposing, if you will, its deficiencies <coughs> is something that is, uh, you know, a, a key principle in Islam. It's not unique to Islam, uh, certainly. Um, this idea in, in, in Arabic, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's pronounced gharar, G-H-A-R-A-R, -A -R, uh, sort of is this idea that speaks to the transparency, the fairness, the conflict of interest uh, concerns that this second cause of the crisis uh, kind of brings into, uh, brings into play. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, is that because of this prohibition of riba, um, and the prohibition on the sale of debt, Islamic finance really requires the asset um, or an asset to be present uh, in the transaction. You can't sell money alone. If you're going to sell, if the four of you want the right to receive uh, money or the right, right to receive what uh, David, Kara, and Tom owe on their homes, you've got to buy an interest in their homes. <clears throat> So you've got to have some fractional ownership interest or whatever it is in the asset in order to be entitled to receive income from that asset. Um, and so it's difficult then to get so far away from the asset when the asset has to come into play every time. And if you're buying a piece of the asset, chances are as intelligent investors, uh, you're going to do your due diligence, you're going to want to know where do they live, do they live in a flood zone or a hurricane zone or all the detailed questions that come into play when you're making an investment, uh, whether you're buying your own residence uh, or, uh, or otherwise. Uh, so keeping yourself kind of close to the asset as well as close to the borrower uh, or the homeowner 
also becomes something that results, uh, is something that's sort of an indirect result, if you will, uh, of some of these uh, some of these principles. <clears throat> so the third um, crisis, or the third cause of the crisis, uh, the third crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, probably we'll get another one. Of <laughs> is this idea of governance uh, failings, um, both at corporate levels, so individual corporations, as well as kind of broader systemic uh, levels, whether you're talking about federal and, and, and state, at least here in the US, or central bank level, and so forth. So at the corporate level, you have executive compensation schemes, uh, executives being paid, uh, or, or I should say incentivized, uh, to make short-term gains at the expense of uh, the longer-term shareholder interests. Um, is sort of the first uh, issue, if you will. Uh, there were certainly inadequate risk reporting uh, and risk governance mechanisms at a lot of corporations. Uh, a lot of the folks uh, who are the buyers here at least uh, assert that they didn't know that these things were on their books, these types of assets, these types of loans were on their books, uh, that they were being bought by the traders down below, you know, on the floor while, while these folks were sitting up. Uh, you know, at the top levels. <clears throat> um, so they didn't really have kind of a clear picture of what their own institutions were doing, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is, I think, which was, you know, really sort of critical to spreading uh, the toxicity, uh, if you will. Um, and again, um, using notions of fairness, equilibrium, risk sharing, uh, bringing those executive compensation schemes in line with sort of shareholder interests um, and shareholder values would be something that would be uh, pretty critical, pretty important um, to mitigating against the crises. Uh, and we are seeing a lot more crises in shorter time periods. And a lot of economists, and I'm not an economist, but if, if you read Stiglitz and some of the other famous economists, then they will tell you that we're seeing a lot more crises in a lot shorter times, time frame. And we're going to see more of that uh, because so much debt um, so much fixed interest income kind of debt is producing uh, systemic instability and that's something that's sort of going to continue uh, versus ec more equity-like structures, which is what Islam would certainly countenance and encourage, uh, would probably produce more systemic uh, stability, at least you know, serve as a strong mitigating uh, factor against, um, against, the, against the instability. Now Islamic institutions, because of these prohibitions on riba and debt, could not buy these toxic assets. They simply were not allowed to purchase them. Um, and because of that, they didn't suffer. Um, at least they didn't suffer because of these types of assets and these types of purchases. And one of the, um, something that's interesting to sort of think about when we think about governance is Islamic finance uses something which is, very, which is novel in the history of Islam, which are something called Sharia advisory boards. These are individuals who are trained ethicists, if you will. You know, their responsibility is to make sure that the institution, in its transactions and its business, keeps itself in line with the Sharia. Uh, this, when I say it's novel, I say that this is something that wasn't in existence in classical history or medieval history. This is something that's come about more recently uh, by Islamic banks. Now, these individuals were sometimes approached by bankers say, why don't we try to figure out a way to buy into these assets, this is a hot asset class. And the response was across the board consistently, no, you're not allowed to. Um, and it might be worth thinking about what role ethical advisory boards could play um, in setting standards for institutions and economies to make sure that limits are respected uh, and adhered to, uh, and how we can kind of augment our own regulatory authorities um, by using um, some sort of ethical review board and ethical audit. Um, <clears throat> kind of five quick lessons that I think come out from this. One is uh, asset-based financing is kind of critical at this point. Uh, bringing assets into play, uh, not just selling money, and not just creating uh, sort of the, you know, finance has become uh, about you know, uh, creating pure financial products, uh, products that are based off of debt uh, and the sale of money alone. They're, we're not, we're so far removed from real economies uh, 
uh, from buildings, roads, manufacturing, you know, things that we can touch and feel, um, and you know, we can even throw intellectual property into that. Uh, but asset-based financing um, has become something that is, uh, is very important, and a lot of investors and buyers now are sort of saying, you know what, I really want to be near the asset. I want to be as close to the asset as possible, so it's just sort of limit uh, the chances of default and, 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 and just losing money. Um, the sale of debt is something that we've talked about as relevant and how that played a role here. Um, increased transparency, uh, both for institutions understanding what they're buying, as well as for borrowers understanding you know, how the loans work and don't work, um, as well as lenders explaining that, and, uh, and regulators kind of playing a role in that uh, as well. Um, <coughs> one thing I think that's kind of interesting, um, as a brief case study, and we can take maybe just a few minutes, um, He's talking about home finance on an Islamic basis here in the U.S. Now, there's a few different providers of home finance in the U.S. The most successful one uses uh, what's called a diminishing partnership model, where the financier, um, what a conventional term would call a lender, uh, acquires an interest in the home along with the consumer, the person who lives in the home. And slowly, over the 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever is agreed to, that financier is bought out. Month, every month, their share is decreasing in the home, uh, and through that, it's sort of a lease-to-own model, but with a partner, if you will. Uh, what's sort of interesting about these structures, and they're probably not perfect from an Islamic point of view, uh, yet, has sort of three features that, uh, that are sort of very consumer-friendly, that are sort of drawn out from Islamic norms. One is this idea of late fees. Normally, uh, <clears throat> Late fees are a percentage of the amount that, that you're laid on, and they compound every month. So under these home financing structures, uh, the late fee, thinking of one in particular, is the lesser of, the lesser of, I think it's either $50 or a percentage of the late amount. And it does not compound. So it's a one-time charge. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that, you know, the idea there is you're in trouble, presumably, uh, and you're not sort of getting more and more into trouble, right? You know, your, your debt doesn't constantly increase. You are struggling, and at the same time, the problem is getting worse. Uh, so that's one feature. The second, if you want to prepay, oftentimes conventional mortgages charge you a penalty. If you want to pay in advance, pay down your loan quicker, there's a prepayment penalty, usually, the, especially in the first few years. Uh, no such prepayment penalties uh, in these structures. The third, and perhaps the, the biggest benefit, if you will, is there are non-recourse loans, which means that if you went through a foreclosure proceeding and <clears throat> the amount the bank got out of the sale was less than the principal amount of the loan, normally it can still come after you for that deficiency. So you've got stories of folks in Florida, for instance, that a year, two years after the foreclosure, the bank's knocking on their door, or better yet, their lawyer's knocking on their door, saying, yeah, you owe 70 grand, 50 grand, whatever it is. Um, and a lot of these people had a few jobs. So these structures, you know, trying to just make up what they've lost. And these structures, these Islamic home finance structures, are non-recourse. They can't, the, the, the Islamic financier doesn't come after you, can't come after you for the deficiency uh, in that case. So there is a degree to which they bear or share that loss with their consumers. Uh, which I think are, are three things that really come out of the principles we've talked to, that speak to the causes of the crisis, um, and that are just sort of really relevant to sort of mitigating against these sort of things uh, from happening. Now, you know, there's nothing to say in here that uh, these institutions can't excessively lend or finance and that uh, individuals who use them, and it's not limited to Muslim people alone, uh, couldn't borrow excessively to build swimming pools and refinance to build this or that. Um, but certainly all of those things are, uh, are possible uh, as well. Um, in closing, I'd probably say uh, that uh, just as the crisis has been global in its effect and in its consequences, um, I would suggest that we think globally and broadly about solutions and we reach out to sort of the, the values and ethics that other civilizations have that may be of relevance, uh, uh, whether they are shared or not. Certainly if they're shared, that makes it easier. There's a lot of values that we have that are shared. Uh, but I think you know, looking for solutions and looking for uh, answers to a lot of these causes 
uh, is something that we can do on a global basis, on the basis of shared ethics uh, and, and norms and, and values. Thank you. So since we're just a small group, maybe we just have questions, raise people to just raise their hands and ask questions rather than writing it down. And then while you're writing, you're asking your questions, I'm going to pass, on, pass out the feedback forms, which we really appreciate you filling okay. it out. I'm struggling yeah. with the concept, not that I don't agree with it, but how it would work that you have a share of an asset. Does that mean all of the money has to occur in a local area? How do you finance a $5 million project? Um, I mean, there's a couple of different ways. One is you could... Uh, Can you repeat the question? I sure, not hear. sure. Um, the, uh, the question is how to, uh, how to structure, how to design the financing, uh, particularly if the asset is going to be shared. Um, excuse me. I think it, <laughs> typical lawyer answer kind of depends. Um, you know, certainly local, if you're a local-based uh, institution and local-based financing would make uh, a lot of sense and be easier in certain asset classes. I would think real estate, given it's more of a local animal, would be something that would be better done locally or at least with teams of people in the different locale who understand the local market conditions and can make intelligent decisions about it. Um, <clears throat> So that's kind of you know maybe one answer. There are um, there are instruments that are done Islamically that are sold globally. Now, to give you, I mean, let me back up. We've talked about the industry as something that's about 40 years old or so, and uh, you know estimates have it at about a trillion, maybe 1.2 trillion of assets under management. Uh, it's probably a little bit larger than that. Um, but to give you an idea of how small that is, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi, which is one of the seven Emirates of the United Arab Emirates, some estimates have the value of its Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is the largest in the world, at that same amount. So that's just a Sovereign Wealth Fund of one Emirate. That's not even one country, that's one Emirate, so that's one state within a federation. Uh, so it's still a pretty tiny uh, market. Uh, but it's one that's attracted a lot of uh, attention, both because of its principles and differences, and because of the tremendous growth area. Uh, a lot of the Muslim world is unbanked. Uh, even more of it is uninsured. Um, so there are certain instruments that are used that are sold globally. There's an instrument in Arabic it's called a sukuk. Oftentimes it gets translated, it's translated as an Islamic bond. It's not entirely accurate. Um, but the majority of buyers of these instruments, and there are Muslim countries, some Muslim countries that issue these, just as the U.S. issues its own debt, that China buys a lot of. Um, and there are corporations um, that issue uh, these instruments. The majority of buyers of these instruments are not Muslim, either as human beings or as institutions. Uh, there's a municipality in Germany that issued one. Not a single Islamic buyer bought in. Um, and that was more because of pricing questions. But what's interesting is the non-Muslim institutions coming in because they see the proximity to the asset, they see the strength of the structure, and they want to buy. Um, so you know these structures do use a shared ownership model. Um, and we're still working out how that ownership is construed. Um, it's not it's not full out legal ownership. Um, common law divides ownership into legal and beneficial. Um, and it uses beneficial, and we're not entirely sure how that's going to play out in courts. But one of the positive consequences of the crisis has been <coughs> we've seen a couple of these instruments go into default. One in the US. The first, there's only two. I think there's only two issuances of these out of the U.S. One was GE just a couple years ago, a $550 million offering for aircraft uh, financing. Another one was a uh, oil, explo oil exploration initiative down in Louisiana called East Cameron. It went into bankruptcy court, actually, that one, the East Cameron one. And the issuer um, said, 
oh well, uh, you know, it's not that we have we actually own the assets. We didn't actually share the ownership of the assets. We just said we did for you know to meet their religious needs. And the investor said, no, I mean, we we are part owners of these assets. We should have sort of first dibs on them. And so the judge sort of sat back, thought about it, came back and said, you know what, this is real ownership. So these other investors do own, you know, a piece of, you know, a fractional interest in these, whatever it was, oil exploration type assets. Um, so it's something still kind of in the works a little bit, and still under development. We've seen one or two of these in courts, um, but certainly it's possible. Uh, now these instruments are at the more sophisticated, institutional level. Um, and uh, the, uh, on, the, um, on the home, Islamic home financing, um, Freddie and Fannie buy. Yeah. The contracts are structured a little differently to meet Islamic requirements as well as their own requirements for Freddie and Fannie as it's sort of chartered its requirements. But Freddie and Fannie buy. Um, now whether Freddie and Fannie repackage and sell, I don't know. Um, but you know, the, the Islamic institution isn't involved in that. Um, so hopefully that kind of gets at your, your question. Tom, did you have to Yes, please. Um, it is easy for us to assume that the financial markets, the normative, oh, I've forgotten the word you were using for non-Islamic conventional. Convention. Yeah. It's easy for us to assume that those conventional markets are based in theory in Christian or Jewish tradition. My observation would be that they are not. My experience uh, of studying both Hebrew and uh, Christian theory about economics is that it's very similar to what you have been saying about Islam. And I wonder what your observation would be of that. I, w I would agree with you that uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the principles are shared uh, amongst these Abrahamic faiths. Um, the, you know, the idea, so the key idea when we talk about governance is that markets regulate themselves, right? That was the key assumption, which appears to have been pretty false at this point, right? Uh, there's a great book, probably one of the most important books of the 20th century called The Great Transformation. How land, labor, well, the book is called The Great Transformation, the uh, economic and political origins of our time. And uh, the author discusses uh, how, uh, how land, labor, and um, I believe capital, money, became commodities. Right? Because pre-modern, and I'll use that term loosely, those three asset classes, commodities, whatever, were not, those three asset classes or things were not commodities. Um, and so it's interesting to study the, the historical origins of that. And you don't see a lot of uh, influence from a particular religion uh, in the traditional sense of the word um, as a, you know, a contributing uh, you know, factor in the development of the idea that markets will regulate themselves. Um, but that appears to be kind of a key fallacy. We've got one question here first, um, and then we can go. I think it's, it starts with a P. The name is escaping me right now. I want to say Carl Polanyi. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Please. Just a little elaboration, if you will, on how the, uh, the homeowner situation would work. The, the investor owns most of the property at the beginning of the uh, transaction and then uh, over time uh, sells their share. And you yeah. said they would share the loss if there were a loss. At least if, if there's a gain, if there's an appreciation in the value of the property, how is that handled? Um, the, way, the way this particular um, structure works, um, let's say C for consumer and F for financier, and then they come into the home. Okay. Um, their ownership ratios would depend on the extent of the down payment the consumer is bringing. Let's assume something like an 80-20 split, which is a tool, you know, at least it's not supposed to be doing on them. Um, so the way this would work is that 80% of the home is owned by the financier, 20 by the consumer. Um, the consumer every month pays um, a monthly, you know, makes a monthly payment, a portion of which 
um, is to buy out a piece of that share, and the other portion of which is rent uh, for occupying that share. Okay. Um, the, um, the adjustment I'd like to see made to the structure um, is to reassess these fractions on some periodic basis because they don't get reassessed. So it's just an assumption that's an 80-20 80 split all the, all the way through, which is fine, except that the 80% right now is artificially tied to the principal amount. Right, so if you bought a home for 500, let's say 100,000, and their share is worth 80,000, um, and then they're owed 75 after you know, some several years, but the home goes down to $50,000 in value, they get the full 50 because they're owed 75. Right? It's not 75% of 50, which is what it could be if it was re, re jigged every time. Or if the principal goes up. Well, the principal alone, yeah, the principal alone somehow went up. Yeah, that, that I mean, I mean the, value. The, value, the value goes up, yeah. So what they do is they say we're, they share on this basis. So you could argue that they never share downside or upside, or you could argue that they do because it's always 80 20. Um, but for now, there's an artificial tie to the principal amount. Um, and I think reevaluating um, or reappraising the property on some periodic basis every year, every couple of years. I mean, that gets, that gets expensive too, right? A few hundred bucks every time. And who's going to cover that cost? And that gets built into then the cost of the financing. So the Islamic transactions were more expensive than their conventional counterparts, and they, their pricing is now more competitive. So the consumer never gains a greatest share of the, of the house? Well, eventually, if, you know, at the end of the term, it make, if the consumer makes every payment, the consumer will own 100%. But and the financier the price doesn't go down in any fashion in between? This, this, this amount? Yeah. No, this amount just goes up. The consumer keeps buying more of the lender's share, the financier's share. So does he get to? 50-50? Yeah, eventually it gets a 50-50, 75-25. Yeah, so eventually it gets 100 and 0. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it does get reevaluated that way. It's just it does get reevaluated that way. The percentages do change as payments are made. Uh -huh. um, but, it's still tied but, but it's still tied to the initial value of the home when you bought the home. Uh -huh. Not when you got 10 years in, not when you sold it, uh -huh. whatever it is. Yeah. Please. So then what would be the impetus for the borrower to lend the money? Well, for this party here? Yes. Uh, well, the, this party, the rent is its profit, right? Because mm -hmm. they bought this home, they rent out their share of the home to this consumer. And so that's where they earn their profit uh, in the transaction. Mm -hmm. And any fees they might charge as well, you know, just like a bank has document fees. Please. Um, so one of the one of the laws in Judaism about um, debt is certainly not something that's practiced, but that is interestingly talked about is that every seven years debt is um, erased as mm -hmm. given, mm -hmm. um, and it comes from scripture. And I'm wondering where that may be in any kind of intellectual thought or practice or ways of looking at this on the planet. There isn't an exact parallel rule to that. Uh, particular rule, um, but there is an encouragement to, um, I mean, to begin with, loans are understood by Islam as charitable acts, because you're not earning a profit on them, and you're giving up the opportunity cost of that capital. Right? You could go spend, the, you know, buy something nice for yourself or make an investment, um, and you're certainly not earning interest on the money. And then, you know, you can argue you're losing money on inflation as well. Um, so they are countenanced as charitable acts to begin with. There is an encouragement to forgive, uh, particularly for debtors in difficult circumstances, uh, and you know to sort of give them more time to make it easier for them to pay. The idea of a late fee, you know, we talked about late fees. Um, <clears throat> classical Islam or medieval Islam forbade penalties. That's a part of the rule of riba. Um, and contemporary scholars have said that, you know, looking at studies and so on and so forth, they feel that a lot of the borrowers or the users of the capital are, are, are they are less honorable than they were a thousand years ago. 
and they are more likely uh, to take advantage of that money and not repay it, particularly if there is no incentive for them to pay it back or to pay it back on time. Uh, so what happens with late fees, and I, I forgot to mention this part, is so there, there's a one-time charge, it's usually a fixed amount, and then act, after the financier deducts its actual costs as a result of the late fee, the balance is donated to charity. So let's say the late fee is 50 bucks. <clears throat> now as a result, so late fees are a profit center for, for banks, right? And they make money on these things. Um, they, they probably, the, the amount of, the amount they, they earn on the late, it, it far exceeds the costs. You know, maybe once you get into foreclosure, it, it gets a little bit, like it's a little more expensive, but still, they typically, they, you know, typically uh, when you go into default, your, your rate can go up. Right? At least in commercial loans, you have a default rate that's actually higher than your regular rate of interest. So what happens with the Islamic structures is that there is a late fee, let's say it's 50 bucks. What the documents require is that the financier deduct its actual costs as a result of the late payment. So these aren't like, I could have taken the money and earned interest on it, but I lost that. It's actual costs, something you actually came out of pocket for. So after you deduct that, from that $50, the balance must be donated to a charity by the financier. So this was kind of a, uh, a compromise solution that the Sharia boards felt would be appropriate to the context. So they want to be fair to the financiers, want to make, you know, they want to be fair to these mortgage providers, so because the mortgage providers need to get paid, they need to get paid on time. And also they don't want to become a profit center, um, and at the same time they don't want to um, or place consumers into situations of difficulty when they may already be in difficulty. Uh, so does that kind of so there is kind of there are some parallels there at least conceptually, but there isn't the rule. And I think that work, the Great Transformation, talks about that particular rule. If I'm not mistaken, um, the seven-year rule where you have the uh, the forgiveness in whole uh, of the debt, um, but. Uh, yeah, something like that. That you know, the idea of uh, forgiving loans, forgiving debt, is something that uh, is it apparently has been completely lost. Right? It actually might be part of a solution to the housing crisis. Right? Because the banks are if the banks aren't getting paid, what's the point of being owed more than you're going to get paid anyway? You might as well forgive, bring people back above water, keep them in their homes which probably protects the family and probably increases the likelihood that he'll get a, you know, he or she will get a job that's decent afterwards, rather than just throwing people on the street and then getting something you, you know, not getting what you wrote anyway. Please. 